thank you all uh, for returning. Um, so uh, I want to continue from where we got to last time, and I want to just remind you of the theme uh, that we introduced. The theme that we introduced was that uh, if we have a category of sheaves that we're interested in, that category of sheaves is capable of determining a homotopy type in many good situations, and that homotopy type is then capable of recovering the category of sheaves. And so what we were going to do is we were going to understand that theme and we were going to apply it in a particular example. And the example that I wanted to think about was the example of constructible sheaves with any kind of reasonable coefficients. So this is the theorem, and I'm in the process of explaining this theorem and sort of showing you how it works. And well, let's, let's look at some of the pieces. Um, well, I have, uh, I told you what this thing is as a category last time, and I introduced that object. Uh, I told you what kind of lambdas I was going to allow. I didn't yet explain, and I won't today, I'll do that tomorrow on, on uh, Friday, uh, uh, what CTS means, what this continuity condition amounts to. Uh, and I uh, actually exhibited a little bit of confusion. I wanted to, to correct a thing that I misstated last time. Uh, I, uh, somebody asked about whether or not this was the same thing as the derived category CTF with this uh, 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 Tor finiteness condition of Deline. And it is, it is the same thing as this, this Tor finiteness. I'm really requiring that the stocks be perfect complexes. So the, the torsion finiteness is there. Um, so this is the same thing as uh, that guy. Okay, so uh, I'm, in the, I'm going to, to tell you more about how to prove this theorem, but I want to spend some time trying to, to motivate the definition of this Galois category. So if you remember, this Galois category was defined, it's just a one category, and the objects are geometric points, and the morphisms are specializations. And one of the interesting properties that we saw about this, if you recall, was the fact that every endomorphism was an automorphism in that category. That there weren't any endomorphisms that weren't invertible. And that's something that we're going to see more of in today's lecture. So, but the, the motivation for this, why, why would you ever contemplate this thing and why would you expect a theorem like this to be true? And the motivation comes from uh, an interesting piece of topology that's been kind of percolating over the past 30 years or so. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about that piece of topology, and I'm going to tell you what it gives you permission to do, and why we can then uh, move to the algebra geometric setting. And folks were really great about typing out questions last time, and so I hope you'll continue to do that this time. So please, I, I've got my, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to answer your questions. So if you have any, even if they're left over from last time, I'm happy to answer. Okay. Uh, so the question that I want to to try to answer today is what kind of homotopy type is this category, is this Galois category? Uh, I want to think of this thing as a homotopy type, but what gives me permission to do that? And that's the, that's the, the question I'm going to answer today. Uh, well, why don't I go ahead and answer it then? So it's a stratified homotopy type. It's a stratified homotopy type. So I'm going to tell you all about stratifications and stratified homotopy types. So here's the basic definition. Uh, so if you have a topological space X, then a stratification of X is a continuous map from X to P. And P here is going to be a post set with the Alexandrov topology. So what's the Alexandrov topology, in case you've not taking general topology in a little while, probably I need to remind you. Uh, so let me just remind you. So an, a, a subset U of P is open if and only if the following condition is satisfied uh, for any X less than or equal to Y. If uh, X is in P, then Y is in P. Oh, sorry, U. If uh, X is in U, then Y is in U. In other words, the opens are the upwardly closed subsets of your POSAT. Uh, you've all, I assume, seen an example of this kind of thing. Uh, so for example, if I just take that POSAT, uh, which I guess on some screens that's not as visible as I want it to be, so maybe I'll 
write this elsewhere. Um, uh, let me just add a page here. So if I look, for example, at this post set here, zero less than less than one, uh, that post set has the property that that point is open and that point is closed. So open, closed. And you can see how to generalize this kind of story. Um, okay, so that's the definition of a stratification. Uh, and so if you have such a stratification, then you can talk about the strata attached to a stratification. And those are just the inverse images of the points in your post set. So if P is a point of P, then this is called the P stratum. So for us to reflect on this kind of definition, let's have a look at a few examples. So I've drawn out a few examples here uh, in the hopes of, of uh, uh, giving you some intuition about how these things work. So here in the first example, I've just got uh, our friend, the interval. Uh, the interval, I'm going to stratify it so that the closed stratum is zero and the open stratum is the interval from the open, a half open interval from zero to one. So it's everything but zero. And that's a stratification over the post set that I identified last time. Uh, I can take both the, if I have a stratification x to p, I'm allowed to take, say, x squared and p squared. I can product those things with themselves, and that'll again be a stratification over a new post set. Um, so here's an example of exactly that. So here's uh, the, the square, the closed square, and I'm going to stratify it over these four points in the stratification. So 1, 1, it's a big open stratum. Uh, 1, 0, that's just this leg here, and one zero, and zero one, sorry, zero one is one leg and one zero is the other leg, and then zero zero is the origin. Uh, let's see here, so some of the other more interesting ones, so there's S1 here, and I've stratified that in two different ways, just to kind of give you an idea. So for example, I've stratified S1 where I just identify a point, and I've also stratified it in another way where I identify two points. So here, this is S1 stratified in two different ways. Um, I can do this with spheres. You see these different kinds of stratifications on these spheres. Uh, here's an interesting one. Well, I don't know if it's interesting, but it's, it's, it exists. So here, what have I got? Well, I've got two points for my stratification, and then I've got two halves of the equator as my next, or as my, my next piece is actually the two halves of the equator. That's the next piece. And then the, the uh, last piece, the big open piece is just the north and south hemispheres. Okay, so that's the idea here. That's the, that's the way these different kind of stratifications work. Um, and uh, I'm going to look at, the, we're going to revisit this table in a little while once I introduce an invariant and we're going to stare at this again. So uh, this is all going to come back to us. Okay, so if you've got one of these, if you've got a stratified topological space, Uh, if you've got a stratified topological space, then uh, how should we speak of its homotopy type? I feel like it could, uh, is someone's mic on? Uh, okay, so, uh, so Sean Tilson asks uh, uh, whether uh, this kind of formalism is useful for thinking about uh, manifolds with corners. Yes, absolutely. So this is the sort of formalism that, uh, that one uses to uh, deal with uh, not just manifolds with corners, but also more generally uh, uh, manifolds with various kinds of singularities, uh, various kinds of singularities and stuff. And so what you do is you, you typically want to take your manifold with singularities and stratify out those singular loci and sort of arrange things exactly for that purpose. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and that's exactly one of the first sort of objectives of stratified topology was to deal with exactly that kind of circumstance. So yeah, that's a great question. That's exactly right. Um, okay, so, but I'm just gonna be interested in the homotopy type. I'm not gonna do all that fancy geometry yet. I'm just gonna try and extract a homotopy type of these stratified topological spaces. But the question is, is that if I have a stratified topological space, how should I talk about its homotopy type? What should I mean by that? 
And again, I'm going to go back to our central principle, which is that I'm going to let the sheaves do the determining of the homotopy type. And then the homotopy type will recover the category of sheaves. And as long as I have that arrangement, then that's, that's going to be, I'm going to consider that a victory. Okay, and so what kind of sheaves should I choose in the case of stratifications? And that's the thing that I want to get to now. Well, if I've got a stratified topological space, then uh, the kinds of sheaves we're going to be talking about are constructible sheaves. So a constructible sheaf on X is a sheaf F such that, well, for any point of the post set, when I take my sheaf and I restrict it to the stratification corresponding to that point of the post set, that thing is locally constant. So I no longer have local constancy over the entire space X. Instead, what I have is I have a way of kind of carving up my X. And then on each of those pieces of that carving up, I have local constancy. OK, so the kind of picture that you should have in mind here is that, well, if I take, you know, say, 0, 1 stratified in this way, then, for example, I could have a sheaf that is act actually just constant here and just doing nothing on the rest of the of the uh, interval. It seems that the stratified homotopy is equipped with an orientation. Does that manifest some topology of the sheaf? Uh, it's, it, there's an orientation in the sense that you know which is closed and which is open. That's true. I mean, the, the post set flows in a direction. That's certainly true. But that's really, it's, it's, it, it does manifest some topology of the, of the sheaf in the sense that it's a, a, a it's the relationship between open and closed, right? So for example, when, when I take the, when I take this post set, when I take something stratified, for example, over this post set here, with the Alexandrov topology, well, I have the first stratum, which is open, and I have the zero stratum, which is closed, and, and that's it, right? I just chose a closed subset and, and it's open complement, and that's all I've done. I haven't done anything more intelligent than that. Um, so, so there's an orientation in the sense that, that, that you, the closed open duality is the, is the orientation that I think you're referring to. Uh, okay, so we're gonna try and understand these constructible sheaves. That's gonna be our objective. We're gonna try and use these sheaves and we're gonna try and use these to determine for us a homotopy type of, construct, of, of uh, stratified topological spaces. And we're gonna see that, the, that, that uh, uh, that uh, stratified homotopy type is sufficient to reconstruct this category of sheaves, these nice constructible sheaves. Okay, so let's start. And so we're going to start the same way we did last time. We're going to start working our way up the Posnikov tower, um, but we're going to get bored in the middle and just pass to infinity uh, so that we finish the job early. Um, so but we'll, we'll start off with the first stage. And so this goes back to a definition, I think this is unpublished, of uh, McPherson. Um, so uh, if I have a stratified topological space, uh, then I'm going to define what's called, what he called the exit path category. So the exit path category, um, I don't know what happened to my notes there, but anyway, I'll write down the uh, objects and the morphisms for you. So the objects are just going to be points of my x. They're just going to be uh, points of x. But then the morphisms, the morphisms are going to be more interesting. The morphisms are going to be exit paths taken up to homotopy. Uh, so what's an exit path? And this is a point that I want to try and be a little careful about, because it's not as obvious a notion as it might seem. Um, so an exit path, how does that look? Well, I'm going to. It's going to be a commutative diagram that looks like this. So here I'm using the stratification that I described before. This is just the stratification that goes like that, where I have zero as the zero stratum and everything else is the first stratum. Um, so I have that uh, stratification. And I'm going to write down a map where on the bottom I just have really a map of posets from 0, 1 into p. And on the top, I have a path inside X, but it has to preserve this structure that's given to you by these posets. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if I'm inside X here and I have a stratum, then 
uh, if I want an exit path, I have to get out and stay out. As soon as I've moved from one stratum into another stratum, I have to do that immediately. First of all, I have to do that instantly. And then once I'm there, I can't go back in. I'm not allowed to go back into any other strata. I have to stay in the strata that I'm in. And so that's the definition of an exit path. But I'm going to take these things up to homotopy, and that's what's going to allow me to compose these things. So let's look at a couple of examples of this, uh, of exit paths and not exit paths. Uh, can we view exit paths as morphisms of stratified spaces uh, from 0, 1 to x? Absolutely, yes. Great question. Absolutely. So this is a stratified space, and this is a stratified space, and I've written down a map going across there uh, from the first stratified space to the second. Absolutely right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so I've drawn some examples of exit paths. Um, uh, oh, uh, uh, what uh, structure do the homotopies preserve? Uh, I'll go into great detail about that in a second. I'll be happy to tell you that. Um, is the exit path category a one categorical notion or is there, uh, are there also an infinity categorical notion? Again, fantastic question. I'm just about to answer it. I'll show you exactly how all that works. Um, yeah, these are, these are the right questions. This is good. Um, it turns out I've already got it all prepared, but yeah, it's, uh, those are the right questions. So I wanted to draw some pictures of exit paths and non-exit paths just to get uh, these things in front of you. So on the exit paths, you see the idea here is that you really are getting out right, right away and going from a stratum to another stratum. You go immediately and then you're free to do whatever you want to do in that stratum. But the thing that you can't do is you can't go down a stratum, you can't go from the open stratum to a closed stratum or anything like that. And the other thing that you can't do, I mean, notice the orientation on this thing here. I am in some sense exiting, but for the purposes of our work here, I don't wanna con consider this an exit path because I spend some time in another stratum before I go into the final stratum that I, I pass between strata somewhere in the middle of my interval and I don't wanna do that. Now, so uh, this thing is, however, homotopic to an exit path, right, which goes like that. That is an exit path. But this thing right here, before I do all that, is not an exit path, okay? And of course, I'm allowed to take loops. I can take loops that stay inside a stratum, but I can't take some loop that sort of dips into a previous stratum and then comes back. That's not the sort of thing that's permitted. So if I'm in a stratum and I feel like looping, I'm happy to do that, but I just need to stay where I am. I can't go out to some other stratum. So the, you know, when you're exiting, the doors lock behind you and the doors are also locked in front of you. You can only go through one door at a time, as it were, when you're taking an exit path. So I thought I'd draw some pictures of, ex of the uh, exit path categories attached to these examples um, because it seemed like fun. So uh, in some of these, I think you'll see that these things are kind of interesting. Uh, some of these have properties that are a little surprising. Uh, so let's look at them for a second. So here I've got the interval. Uh, and well, I, I hope you might have predicted that indeed I'm just getting this thing as a post set regarded as a category now. Nothing really exciting very happened there. Um, uh, that's quite dull. Uh, okay, but I could take zero, one squared, and well, the exit path category is the product of the two exit path categories, so that worked out very nicely. Um, here's an interesting one. Here's zero, one squared uh, stratified over just, just the post at zero, one, two. So I just have three strata, the closed stratum, the open stratum, and then in between them is the locally closed stratum. And the exit path category just recovers that same post set. So the first three examples that I've drawn here, up to this up to this line right here, the first three examples that I've drawn are uh, all have the property that the exit path category happens to coincide with the post set over which you're stratified. That needn't be the case, however, as we see in this example right here. If I take the exit path category of S1 stratified in this way, well, then what can I do? I can start at that point and I can exit one way or I can exit the other way. But as soon as I do, I only have a contractible space in which to stratify, right? If I look at these two strata, I've got, a, I've got a contractible stratum, which is the point, and I've got another contractible stratum, which is everything that isn't that point. So I have these two contractible strata, but the exit paths, I have two distinct ones. And one thing that you can notice if you're looking at this and you're thinking 
from the point of view of, of nerves of categories and things, you can notice that the nerve of this category exactly recovers S1. That isn't an accident. That's going to be a, a general phenomenon that we're going to witness a little bit later. Uh, but it's something to think about right now. Uh, another uh, situation in which you can get the nerve of the category exactly recovering S1 is this example here. So in this example here, I have two different points. And well, what can I do? I can flow into the top stratum or the bottom strata, or the top half of the stratum or the bottom half of the stratum in two different ways. And so this becomes uh, that post set there. Sean Tilson asks, uh, when I get to a suitable stratified space, on this page, can I give another example of a constructible sheaf? Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, I can give you a whole pile of examples. So the idea behind the definition of a constructible sheaf is the following. Uh, if you look at locally constant sheaves, one of the things that's a little unsatisfying about them is that they're not closed under push forward, right? So if I take the push forward of a, of a, of a locally constant sheaf, it won't be locally constant anymore. An example of this, for example, is if you have an open immersion, if you have an open subset of a topological space, and I try and push forward a locally constant sheaf, it won't be locally constant anymore. It'll be locally constant on the locus of that open subset, but it won't be locally constant anywhere else. And so the idea behind constructible sheaves is that you're just going to put together all of the different ways that you could try and take push forwards of things from constant or locally constant sheaves. And that's the idea. So, uh, you know, for any, any time you see a set with an open subset, you can think about just push, for, push forward the constant sheaf along an open immersion. And that gives you tons and tons of examples of constructible sheaves. And there's a sense in which you can kind of build all of them from that kind of operation. And so that's a really good sort of, you know, uh, uh, way to generate these examples. There's tons of constructible sheaves out there. Um, Okay, let me give you a different kind of example here on this, on this side here. Let's look at S2. So if I look at S2 and I'm gonna stratify it where the only closed stratum is gonna be the point and then everything else is gonna be the open stratum. And I look at the exit path category and well, what can happen? I can exit from this point out to somewhere on the sphere that isn't that point. And they're all homotopic, aren't they? Uh, they're all homotopic in a way that sort of respects that stratification. So, this is it, that's the exit path category, it's zero, zero is less than one, it's that post set. You might be a little unsatisfied with that answer because this thing doesn't look so good from the point of view that we were expressing down here. Over here we were saying, look, that, that category is nice because that, the nerve of that category recovers my space. And you might be a little angry that this, that hasn't happened here. We're gonna address that concern in a moment. Um, now, if I add a little more, if I put a little more effort into stratifying my S2 and add just one more point to my stratification, then I can get a category that will work great. So this was my best attempt to draw a picture of, this is a category where I have three objects up to isomorphism. I have three objects, zero, one, and zero prime. I have uh, uh, unique maps from zero and zero prime into one, but then one has a big pile of automorphisms indexed by the integers. So those are supposed to represent all the automorphisms that you have of one. And now, so what happens if I take the nerve of that category? If I take the nerve of that category, well, then I'm suspending BZ. In other words, I'm suspending the circle, so I'm getting S2 as you'd like. So that one seems good, whereas the previous one doesn't seem so good. And that's an interesting question. Uh, in the next example here, I've got S2 and I'm stratifying it how? I'm stratifying it by taking a point on the equator, the rest of the equator, and then the rest of the sphere. Uh, and then if you sort of check it out, then you get this exit path category here, where here the, the uh, I'll just emphasize that this, if I just, this highlighted piece here is, uh, uh, it, it equal, the, the map from one to two equalizes the two maps from zero to one. Uh, the two composites are supposed to be equal. But the two maps from zero to one are distinct. Here's yet another stratification of S2. So now I'm taking two points on the equator, the rest of the equator and the rest of the sphere. And then you get this pleasant little shape. And that's a nice post set. That post set, the nerve of that post set is, again, recovers the sphere. So it's quite satisfying. 
Uh, and then there's the torus, and the torus is just two copies of the circle. So if you take the two copies of this circle here, stratified in this way, then I'll get the torus. Uh, David Corwin says, uh, is the exit path category always represented by a quiver? Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, I don't remember what the, the correct definition of a quiver is. Uh, it, David, if you tell me what a quiver is, then I'll be able to answer your question. <laughs> the, the example uh, with the S2 and the, and the equalizer is it's a quiver with relations. It's not a quiver because the okay. quiver doesn't have relations. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not up on my quiver knowledge. I, what the, the thing that is true about these is that they're always categories uh, with the property that every endomorphism is an isomorphism. But that's the only restriction that you have. Um, so I don't know if people normally count that as a quiver, but uh, I, I guess Mark is telling me that the answer is no. Um, okay, so these are just some examples to kind of get our intuition flowing here. Um, and so, so, but, but one of these examples is a little strange, right? We want to think about this again, because there's something kind of funny there, and we'll come back to that funniness. Okay, so but here's the theorem. Why did I introduce this silly thing in the first place? The reason I introduced this silly thing is that if X is a reasonably stratified topological space, so uh, a reasonable stratification, uh, uh, the correct condition is a conical stratification, but uh, unless someone insists, I'm not gonna go get into details about what reasonable means in this case. It's, you can think of this as a kind of vibrancy condition. It's just making sure that, that your, your uh, uh, your stratification is not too wild. Uh, if you have a reasonable stratified topological space, then you have an equivalence of categories between the constructible sheaves of sets, here they're sets, on X, and functors from the exit path category into the category of sets. And uh, I prefer to call this the exodromy equivalence. Why exodromy? Well, uh, what's happening here is that, you know, when we're talking about monodromy, remember, we were talking about taking a loop and we we're talking about traveling around that loop once, right? So that was monodromy. Here, we're taking exodromy, which means that we're watching what happens to our section as we exit, as we follow an exit path, hence exo. Okay, uh, so this is a good story, but again, we had this little slightly unsatisfying problem here which is that, well, it, it was a little strange to think about S2 stratified by this stratification here. This stratification seemed a little confusing, so I, I just drew a, an example of an exit path just for fun. I sort of spun around the thing a little bit. Oh, Mark Levine asks, what the, what's the composition in Pi 1? So I just, I can compose exit paths, uh, and if my stratification is good, then when I compose two exit paths, I'll get another exit path or up to homotopy, but it's only defined up to homotopy. So that's why I'm working with exit paths only up to homotopy. Um, so, so one thing that's a little unsatisfying here uh, is that, well, I've got this exit path, but it seems like uh, it's a little strange to say that there's only one exit path out into the sphere. That seems odd because after all, if I'm thinking about a point, if I'm thinking about my presence right here on the earth and I think about exiting this room into you know, the world at large, I sort of have the idea that I could go that way, or I could go that way, or I could go that way, or I could go that way. And those all seem to be different in some sense. They're homotopic, but I want to try and keep track maybe of the homotopies between them. And so a better solution, this was suggested by David Truman, was that I should define instead a two category. So that when I look at the, and this is the sort of exit path two category, so that the HOM now groupoid from zero to one should be an S1, that my path should go that way or that way or that way. Uh, Jean-Michel asks, uh, does the conical condition ensure that the composition is well-defined? It does indeed, that's exactly the point. Uh, if I don't have the conicality, then I don't really have uh, a well-defined composition. That's exactly right, um, yeah. Uh, that's right, so okay, so, but, and, and the same thing is gonna be here in this two category as well. I wanna be able to th try and think not only about the fact that, that uh, I can go out and all those, all the different ways I could go out are actually secretly homotopical, 
or homotopic to one another, but I also want to try and keep track of that homotopy. So for example, the act of going around this way and then sort of spinning around, that has some kind of uh, uh, content. And I want to try and keep track of that content. So I really want this to be, oops, I really want this to be the set of maps, now set groupoid of maps from zero to one. And what Truman showed uh, in the early 2000s, I think, uh, is that if, uh, if X is again this kind of reasonable stratified topological space, then we have a sort of higher categorical version of, uh, of the exodromy equivalence. I have the exodromy equivalence now with constructible sheaves of groupoids, and I can compare that to functors, just plain old functors, from pi 2 XP to groupoids. And again, how does the, how does the functor work? Let's think about it. Well, if I have a constructible sheaf F on my X valued in groupoids, then what can I do with it? Well, I can try and extract a functor defined in the following way. So here's what the functor is going to do. Well, the objects of this two category, the objects are just points, little x of x. And what am I going to tell you? I'm going to tell you to take your sheaf and take its stock at that point. That's what this functor does on objects. And then on morphisms, well, you have to do a little work to say that, that you've actually got a well-defined functor. And that's why this is a theorem and not you know, an observation. Uh, but you do indeed have a well-defined functor when you're sort of passing out from one stratum to another. And so uh, this is quite inspiring. But again, you start to have the same feeling again when you think, think about more general stratifications. We said we passed to this two categorical thing and that looked better, but you start to have the same kind of sinking feeling that something's going to go wrong if I take an N sphere. So if I take an N sphere stratified again with just two strata, the closed stratum being say the, the North Pole and the rest of the sphere as the open stratum, then well, I have this problem that I'm going to start to get these contractible mapping spaces. Right? As soon as n becomes at least 3, I start to have these contractible mapping spaces. And clearly, this kind of game is, is pretty unsatisfying. So we need to go ahead and cut to the chase and start defining ourselves an infinity category. So we're going to define exit path infinity category. And that exit path infinity category is going to be defined so that the mapping space in this thing from 0 to 1 is going to be the n minus 1 sphere in just the same way that when I was trying to exit this room, I had a circle of ways to do it. Now when I'm going to exit the North Pole to the rest of the sphere, I'm going to have an S n minus one ways of doing that. So let me give you the definition of this thing precisely. So I'm going to give this definition to you in the following way. I'm going to try and tell you what the n simplices of the exit path category are. So these are the chains of maps, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up to n, sitting inside your category. And I'm going to tell you what the set or space of those things should be. Uh, so how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to start off by taking the n simplex, and I'm going to stratify it. And the way I'm going to stratify it is kind of the way that I drew in one of the, one of the pictures. I'm going to stratify it in such a way that, well, if I look at the first k strata, then that is the case, the, K, the delta zero through k sitting inside delta n. I'm going to stratify it over the, over the post set n. So I'll just emphasize this. It's over this post set here. I'm just going to stratify it in that way. Uh, and it's going to be stratified in that way uh, for all n. So it's going to look sort of like that. That's my two dimensional picture, but the same kind of process works for all dimensions. And now, what am I going to do if I take a reasonable stratified topological space, then I'm going to take the exit path category, or exit path infinity category, uh, to be the infinity category whose n simplices, well, they're morphisms in just the same way that uh, the questioner suggested, they're morphisms of stratified spaces from this stratified space labeled lambda here to your favorite stratified space x over p. And that's what the n simplices look like. So what's happening here? Well, here I'm allowing myself to sort of, I'll take an exit path, so that goes out. 
and I'll, if I have another exit path, then I'll allow myself to consider uh, homotopy that connects the two things. And that's a two simplex in my, uh, in my exit path infinity category. So I'm hoping that this answers, uh, I think it was Remy's question. I hope this answers uh, his question. Um, and so then I also have three simplices that will allow me to sort of talk about a homotopy of homotopies and homotopies of homotopies of homotopies. And I don't get to stop at any finite stage, so I have to just keep doing that. And so this gives me access to now this beautiful exit path category, uh, exit path infinity category. And this exit path infinity category, I really want us to think about this exit path infinity category as sort of giving us a homotopy type of a stratified topological space. So if that's gonna be the case, then our principle is that homotopy and sheaves determine each other. So then we have this theorem of Lurie, which is that uh, X over P is again gonna be reasonable in the same way as before. It's gonna be a reasonable stratified topological space. And then we have an exogamy equivalence between constructible sheaves valued in any infinity category C and functors from the exit path category into that C. And again, the, on objects, what happens, it's the same thing. You, you take your constructible sheaf and you take its stalks at all the different points of your space. Okay, so the question that we have to ask now is what kind of justification do we have for the idea that this uh, is a good homotopy type, that this uh, is pi infinity of x over p, this, this object is a good homotopy type. And furthermore, what kinds of structure does this thing have? How can we think about this category in a way that sort of seems familiar to us? So here's an observation, and this is a, an important observation for our purposes especially. Uh, this infinity category, pi infinity x over p, comes equipped with a functor, right? If I take pi infinity x over p, well, that's, that's the, uh, the objects are points, and the morphisms are exit paths, and the two morphisms are homotopies of exit paths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I've got this functor here, and well, what can I do? How does this functor work? I can take a point x, and I can just tell you which stratum it's in, right? Uh, I could just tell you which stratum it's in, like that, if f is the name of my stratification. Uh, so I have a perfectly good functor. Uh, and well, if I think about what this functor is, uh, I can look at the inverse image of any point in my POSA. And what's, what am I going to get? Well, when I look up over a point in the POSA, I'm going to have just the stratum sitting over me and I'm gonna have the whole homotopy type of that stratum, right? I'm allowed to put any simplex, there are no conditions on how this simplex back here behaves if my n here goes all the way to a single point, uh, is a constant at a single point of the POSAT. There are no conditions on this whatsoever. So that means that I'm allowed to look at any n simplex I like of my x, which means that when I look at the inverse image of a point under this map, then I'm exactly getting here the infinity groupoid attached to my space. So remember what the situation is, is I'm looking at the, so, and this is regarded as, a, as the singular simplicial set. This is the singular simplicial set of that stratum, right? So, uh, oh, Sean Tilson says, can I go back two slides? Uh, you're confused about the stratification on delta two. Sure, of course. Uh, so here's the stratification on delta two. There it is. Uh, so uh, it goes zero, one, two. It's a stratification. What's the edge between zero and two? Uh, the edge between zero and two is part of the second stratum, right? Uh, everything except for uh, the edge between zero and one is in the second stratum. It's in, it's in stratum two. So stratum zero, which just consists of zero, zero. Uh, there's stratum one, which consists of uh, everything except for the vertex, and there's stratum two, which consists of everything except for that edge. That's what the that's the stratification that we're taking here. Um, is reasonable the same condition as in the classical case? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. I'm I'm just talking about what I would call conical stratifications. 
in the classical case, you can actually get away with something slightly more general, but it's not, it's not important. Um, you, you really want to have this much, you really want the reasonable condition. Yeah. Um, so that's just being conically stratified, which basically I can just tell you, basically what it means is that in the neighborhood of every point, that stratified space looks like a cone with its stratification. Um, and so if you want me to say more precisely how that works, I can, but, uh, but let's leave it for now. Um, okay, so what does that mean? So that means that this functor here has, the, has an interesting property. This functor F here has an interesting property. I have this category, it maps down to a post set and the inverse image of a point is a groupoid, right? All the morphisms are invertible. Um, can you realize this sort of as a join of stratified spaces? So I get the stratification of delta n by taking joins of delta zeros. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, that's, that's exactly right, yeah. You can just keep joining on a new delta zero each time. That works out fine, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, but I just wanted to say this, this one word here, which is conservative. <laughs> this functor here is conservative. Uh, what does that mean? That means that uh, if I have a morphism in pi infinity of x over p, and it becomes an isomorphism in, x, in p, well, what does that mean? That means it has to be the identity, because p is just a poset. Then it already was uh, an, an equivalence, an isomorphism upstairs. So in other words, I've got this functor. It's as an, this is a functor from an infinity category to a post set, but it's also conservative. Right? The inverse image of any point is actually just an infinity groupoid. And it's the infinity groupoid attached to uh, the stratum XP. And so this is a very special class of categories that have conservative functors to post sets. Sometimes in the literature, you'll, in, at least in, in ordinary category literature, you'll see these referred to as EI categories. I've never liked this terminology, but I guess the, the statement's supposed to be that every endomorphism is an isomorphism, so it becomes EI categories. Um, okay, so here's the theorem. Uh, the theorem here is that the assignment that carries stratified topological spaces to uh, these kinds of infinity categories, infinity categories with a conservative functor down to the same poset, that's the assignment that carries uh, your stratified topological space to this uh, exit path infinity, infinity category, this is actually an equivalence of homotopy theories. So this is a theorem of my PhD student, Peter Hain. Um, but there are versions of it that sort of have, have uh, been circulating prior to this. So uh, one is this uh, Ayala Francis Rosenblum paper. Uh, and another one is, uh, and there's some, there's some joint work of non Blal and Wolf that also sort of points in this direction. But let me take a minute to sort of emphasize what this is telling you. So, uh, oops. So, uh, here we go. So, you know, if you recall, there's this sort of uh, uh, homotopy hypothesis of Grothendieck. And the homotopy hypothesis, what does it say? Um, it says that, well, if you want to talk about topological spaces up to homotopy, then topological spaces up to homotopy can be dealt with algebraically in the form of infinity groupoids. Uh, nowadays, we tend to think of infinity groupoids as just uh, simplicial sets satisfying the con condition. And that's just our, that's just now these days, maybe even our definition of infinity groupoid, at least for some, some practitioners. Uh, and so this homotopy hypothesis is really just this equivalence of model categories between topological spaces and simplicial sets, which goes back to Kahn. So this homotopy hypothesis of growth in Deke, what does it really permit you to do? It really permits you to say, uh, oh, let's see, can I build up any linearly stratified space uh, using iterated parametric joins where I could specify the homotopy type of the link as well? Uh, yes. Uh, that's a good question. Um, yes, so the question was, uh, so, so suppose that I have, 
So let me uh, let me actually take a moment to answer that question because it's a really neat question and I want to I want to do a fair job of answering it. So suppose that I'm trying to build up a stratified topological space X. And let me just do this with two strata just for a, just for a second just to give you a clear idea of how this thing operates. So suppose that I have my two strata X0 and X1 and I want to uh, have X0 be the closed stratum and I want to have X1 be the open stratum. And so the question is what other information do I have to give you in order to construct this stratified, the stratified topological space here? And the answer is, well, I have to tell you about the deleted tubular neighborhood of X0 inside the thing that you're going to construct. I have to provide you with the information at the link, as it's called. And so how does that work? Well, I have to give you some sort of information about something that I'm going to call X01. And it needs to come with maps from X0 to X0 and X1. And so this thing is going to be uh, it's going to be the deleted tubular neighborhood of X0 in the thing that I'm going to construct in X, in the, the union of these two things. And then, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to put these two pieces together to give me this X. Right? So what am I telling you here? I'm telling you that actually stratified homotopy types, another way to reconstruct them, this, I'm still just working with the stratification over, over P equals zero, 01 right now. Um, but uh, stratifications uh, over just P equals zero, 01 are given to you precisely by diagrams like this. Um, and now, so the question is, well, what happens if I take a more exotic post set? And the answer is, well, I have to choose a more exotic diagram. And the exotic diagram I choose is by taking the subdivision of P op. And so if you take a, a diagram satisfying certain properties, uh, basically a Siegel condition um, indexed on, on the subdivision of P op, then I can actually reconstruct the entire stratified space. Um, and that's actually a, a key component in how uh, Peter proves this theorem here. Uh, one of the things that he does is he doesn't just work with these uh, categories with a conservative functor down to a post set. Uh, he also replaces these, he also considers at the same time uh, what uh, we started calling uh, decollages over P. And these are functors from the opposite of the subdivision of P into spaces satisfying a Siegel condition. And these things turn out to be the same. So that's, that's, that's how you can build up a, a stratified space by just taking the strata and all the sort of iterated links. Uh, do I have time to remind us what the Siegel condition says? Sure, I got time for anything. Let's tell you. Uh, yeah, so what does the Siegel condition say? Well, so if I'm talking about a functor, maybe I shouldn't call it X. Maybe I've called too many things X. If I've got a functor from the subdivision op to spaces, what's the Siegel condition going to look like? Well, let me tell you. Uh, uh, so what are these things? The objects here are, they're linear, li linearly ordered subsets of your POSAT P. They're linearly ordered subsets of your POSAT P. And so uh, to any sort of linearly ordered post to subset of P, I can associate a space, which is this guy here. And well, I've got a functor from SD op into uh, spaces. So what does that entitle me to do? Well, it entitles me to write down a map uh, from uh, D applied to P0 through PN to D applied to any of the individual pieces. So this is P0 less than P1. All right, so that's the link between the strata P0 and P1. And then I'm going to talk about the link between the strata P1 and P2. And I'll just keep doing that. Clark, I don't think we can see what you're writing at the bottom of the page. Maybe you can scroll. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, I see. It, it becomes too, too far down. I'll try that again. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, here, I'll just erase this and write above it instead. That's right. I always forget that there's that weird band that Zoom puts on everything. Thanks, Paul. So what can I do here? I can write a map down to D of P0, P1, uh, cross over D of P1 with D of P1, P2, etc. cetera, uh, up to D of Pn minus 1, Pn.
And so I'm perfectly allowed to consider this map and the Siegel condition says that this is an equivalence. And that's the Siegel condition. Uh, does the target of Haynes equivalence behave well as we change the pose at P? Yes, it absolutely does. Uh, this equivalence is uh, completely functorial in P. Um, so I, it, I've written this down as a, uh, with a fixed P, but there's a statement that, uh, that works uh, for all P simultaneously. Um, and, and yeah, uh, absolutely yes. This is, if you like, this is a, a fiber of a parametrized equivalence of homotopy theories, if you wanted to say it that way. Uh, yeah, so this is what the decollage perspective allows. It says that if you if you want to understand these things by kind of in decollage, the idea of that word there was that I was going to take the strata and the the links and just sort of disconnect them all, and then use that to be able to reconstruct the thing that I actually want, which is this uh, infinity group order, this homotopy type, this stratified homotopy type, and this is telling you exactly what the rules are for regluing your thing from the individual pieces, the strata. Um, and so what have I got here? Well, I've got, we had this homotopy hypothesis of growth and Dink, which says that, that spaces and infinity groupoids should be the same basic data. Spaces considered up to homotopy and groupoids should be the same basic data. And what uh, Peter is telling you, Peter Hain is telling you, is that uh, uh, stratified topological spaces should be a certain kind of infinity category. And uh, in fact, this thing really is an equivalence of homotopy theories. Uh, by the way, for people who like this kind of thing, you, you might be amused to know that there, there isn't or doesn't appear to be uh, an actual model structure on the left-hand side. It appears that you have to work with a semi-model structure in order to get this uh, off the ground. But nevertheless, this does happen and it is a, a correct theorem. Um, okay, so what's our moral here? The moral is that just as homotopy types are infinity groupoids, that's the growth and homotopy hypothesis, stratified homotopy types are certain kinds of infinity categories with a conservative functor to a poset. So what does that give us permission to do? Well, growth and homotopy hypothesis uh, gave us permission to say, well, if I want to understand spaces, for example, if I want to understand things like homotopy types of schemes, I'm allowed to construct those things in an essentially algebraic way by building simplicial, simplicial sets with certain properties. Uh, and so that's exactly how you construct the atoll homotopy type. That thing is constructed as a simplicial set with this and that property. And so what we're doing now is we're asking ourselves, well, what happens if I introduce a stratification? So now the idea is that if I take a scheme and I want to associate to it a stratified homotopy type, something that's capable of detecting its constructible sheaves, then I should be trying to construct that stratified homotopy type as an infinity category with the conservative functor to a poset. Now, interestingly, if you work with just a single poset, uh, you end up with something that's got quite a lot of homotopy. Uh, but uh, as David Corwin pointed out, uh, pointed out on Monday, uh, it turns out that if you take all of the posets simultaneously and you sort of take the inverse limit of over all those things, then you're going to get yourself a profinite uh, stratified homotopy type. And that stratified, pro uh, that profinite stratified homotopy type is going to be exactly the Galois category that I defined last time. So now what's our plan? Uh, our plan is to and I'll get to the fun fact in a minute. Uh, the plan, though, is to, is to pass to schemes. That's our next objective. So we're going to pass to schemes. And the way in which we're going to do that is we're going to use this fun fact here, which is that if you've got a scheme, and you know, for technicians out there, I mean coherent scheme. Uh, if you've got a scheme, then when you think about it, Zariski topological space, uh, that is a limit in the category of topological spaces. This is really happening in the category of topological spaces of posets with their Alexandrov topology. In other words, the Zariski topological space is really just telling you that you have a profinite poset on your hands. And so now what are we going to do in the next lecture? What I'm going to do is I'm going to start defining uh, the notion of a stratified, I'm going to stratify the atoll topology over the Zariski topology. And I'm going to look at the corresponding exit path category. And that will turn out to be exactly gal. And that will be just what we need to prove all of the theorems, including the main theorem of the, of the 
of the mini course. Okay, I think this is a good place for me to stop. So uh, please ask your questions. I, I know you have them and I'm happy to answer them. Okay, well, first we all want to thank you, Clark, for, uh, for a wonderful talk, so. Thank you. Uh, Mark Levine asks, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Mark Levine asks, uh, do I have perverse sheaves uh, in that uh, category, in the category of constructible sheaves? So let me s switch back to that page. Uh, and it, but the answer is yes. Uh, let's see. Here's my funny diagrams. It's got to be here somewhere. I didn't state a theorem in this talk, didn't I? Okay, there it is. Yes. Yeah, so there are perverse sheaves here. Um, the, uh, uh, it's actually, this is one of the things that, that isn't written down yet, actually, interestingly, is how you sort of cut out the, the, the perverse sheaves. It's, it's a fun exercise. The first step, as you might imagine, uh, is to, to correctly identify the six functors from the sort of uh, uh, this functorial point of view, the point of view of this category on this side. Uh, and actually writing those down is actually a, a with all their sort of available properties as a, a fun exercise, but it's, it's in a sense, it's an exercise in sort of weird pure category theory. Oh, Mark asked in the general setting of a stratified topological space. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you absolutely have a category of perverse sheaves there too. In fact, I mean, you know, the answer is, is the same from this sort of exodromy standpoint. I'm still just talking about functors of different kinds. Here I have to do it with some continuity conditions, but in the, in the uh, topological setting, I can work with just honest categories. And again, it's, you know, the six functors are defined uh, uh, in sort of categorical terms in that way. So Remy asks, uh, what does the modifier cons uh, in Haynes' theorem mean? Uh, it just means conservative functors down to the post set. Uh, so let me go back to Haynes' theorem and emphasize that point. Thanks. Let me see. It's somewhere around here. There it is. Uh, yeah, so here I wrote, I wrote cons, and let me ask what's, what's cons mean? It means conservative functor down to the post set. So I'm looking at an infinity category over a post set, and I insist that that, that functor, that structure functor, be a conservative functor, so that the inverse images of points are all infinity group points. Is the category of all good stratifications always filtered for any manifold? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so you're, you're saying the category under refinement as I, as I take further and further refinements. That's right. So if I have any two uh, stratifications, they have a common refinement. That's right. I'm absolutely allowed to do that. Uh, I said the, ex uh, the excitement equivalence is a fiber of a parametrized equivalence. Uh, yeah, I did say that. Um, so I think the way, the way to think about this is that, well, I have a, I have a oops, <laughs> I have a category uh, strat top, which is just all stratified topological spaces and all posets. And I have a forgetful functor down to the associated poset for the stratification. And on the other side here, I have, uh, well, let's see here, I'll call these, maybe I'll call these EI infinity categories since I used that term before. I could talk about these EI infinity categories. These are infinity categories that have the property that uh, if I, uh, that have the property that every endomorphism is an equivalence. Uh, and that has a forgetful functor down to the category of posets as well. These two are just equal. And the claim is that these things are equivalent in a way that preserves the poset structure like this. Um, so that's the, and then if I take fibers over P, then I get the equivalence that I wrote down in Haynes' theorem here. Um, do exit paths correspond to field extensions when X is spec K? So yes, that's right. So for, for uh, X being spec K, well, it depends on what you mean precisely, but uh, 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 an exit path, if I'm just talking about spec K, then I only have one stratum to work with. So all of my exit paths are invertible. And uh, that in, what is that invertible thing? Well, if I've got two separable closures of my, of my field, then I can talk about an isomorphism between them. So the only exit paths are isomorphisms of those field extensions. That's all I have. Uh, more generally, if I have two different points of my scheme, then an exit path is going to be thought of as a specialization. Uh, and I'm going to have that specialization relationship. So I'll talk about that in, in more detail next time for sure. Uh, Remy asks, how is the uh, 
reasonable stratification hypothesis captured in Haynes' theorem? Uh, that's a very fine question. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, there's a question before that. What is the problem with putting a model structure on the category of stratified spaces over a particular P? Uh, this, the problem is the following. Uh, this is hard. So the problem is the following. The problem is that it doesn't appear that there is a, a, a how do I say this so that it comes out correctly? There doesn't appear to be a, uh, you know, not every, you know, in the category of topological spaces, every object is vibrant, and we use that a lot when we prove the equivalence between uh, stratified topological space or ordinary topological spaces and simplicial sets. In this context, uh, not every stratified topological space is vibrant, and uh, so you have to. Roughly speaking, what happens is that if you want to do a fibrant replacement, you first need to do a kind of co-fibrant replacement. Um, I, I can get into more detail about that uh, at a different time. That that's a very technical issue, but uh, I can tell you what the, what the issue is. Um, I, I, it could be that there's a different model structure that we didn't think of, but it, it doesn't look good. Um, no, but so Remy asked, uh, uh, how is the reasonable stratification hypothesis captured in Haynes' theorem? And that's exactly right. So, so uh, really what happens on this side here is that uh, you have actually a, a model or semi-model structure on these things. And the fibrant guys uh, include these reasonable, uh, uh, the, the reasonable spaces. And it's the fibrant guys that you show correspond to uh, infinity categories with a conservative functor to P. So this is an equivalence of homotopy theories, not of, of abstract spaces or abstract categories. Uh, so for a manifold M, if I take the limit of all of its uh, stratified homotopy types for all good stratifications, what do I get? Uh, you get something kind of, uh, it depends on what you do, what you mean by good stratification, uh, but you end up with something a little unsatisfying. So let me give you an example. So suppose that I take uh, a complex manifold. So I suppose I take a complex variety and I look at all of the uh, uh, finite uh, uh, quasi-compact stratifications of that complex variety. And then I think about the complex manifold attached to that complex variety and I think about the limit of all those things. If I take the limit of all those things, then I have the map from the complex points of my variety with its topological structure down to the Zariski topological space attached to the the variety. Uh, so it's a little bit unsatisfying in that regard. Taking that limit is really, uh, taking that limit without sort of taking the homotopy type first is actually a little unsatisfying as a process. Um, and that's actually, a, there's a big frustration there that uh, uh, I can tell you about. <laughs> uh, let's see what else have I got here. Uh, is there any new insight into Riemann-Hilbert type correspondences in this language? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, so uh, that's actually another thing that uh, I'm working on with my uh, current PhD student, Harry Gindy, uh, my former PhD student, Jay Shaw, and uh, well, anyone else who wants to be interested. Yes, I think so. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting issues there is that, that you know, the, the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence includes this sort of very there's an analytic part to that story in the, in the usual Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. And uh, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sidestep that really analytic part of that story. Um, so I, I can tell you more about that if you write me, I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, is there a version of Whitehead's theorem for stratified homotopy groups? Well, so what there is, is there's a, a Posnikov tower uh, for these things. So I can tell you what it means to be uh, connected or uh, truncated as a stratified uh, homotopy type. So for example, being truncating, being in truncated just means you're an N category. Um, and uh, so there is a Posnikov tower and it does converge. Um, how excited that makes you, I'm not really sure, but there, there, is, a, there is a convergent uh, Posnikov tower at least. Um, or the theorem that a map is an equivalence on fundamental group points and cohomologies. Uh, yes, right, so right. So uh, the, there's this fact that if you have a space, any sort of space, and you, uh, uh, and you have a map of spaces, x to y, and it gives you an equivalence on uh, an isomorphism on the fundamental groups and on the cohomologies of uh, both spaces with all, um, 
local systems coefficients, then you have an equivalence. And the same thing is true here. The, the equivalences in these stratified topological spaces are, um, are equivalences of categories of constructible sheaves. I guess I should say infinity categories of constructible sheaves. So in other words, yes, uh, that's the short answer to that question. Um, let's see. Uh, someone asked, what if I take the limit of the homotopy types? I'm not sure if I follow. Uh, oh, oh, this is in reference to the, to the Zariski topological space thing, right? So you can do that. You can take the limit of the homotopy types. Uh, but really what you should do is you should first profinitely complete and then take the limit of the homotopy types. And if you do that, you'll actually recover a gal of the original complex algebraic variety. So that's a sort of stratified Riemann existence theorem. And that's in our paper on exodromy. Uh, does this perspective allow one to write down a Durham complex for a manifold with corners? Uh, That sounds like a good question, Sean. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> no, that sounds like a great question. I, unfortunately, I don't really know the answer. Um, it sounds really interesting. Uh, oh yeah, Peter Hain is reminding me uh, that uh, uh, another form of Whitehead's theorem is that uh, a map of stratified topological spaces is an equivalence if and only if it's an equivalence on all strata and all links. Um, and so that's, that's another way to sort of characterize the equivalences on the left-hand side here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Peter Haynes in the chat, he should answer your question better than, he can answer your question way better than me, Michael. It's a <laughs> um, yeah. Other questions? I know you have some. Or since you know you have Posnikov towers, uh, we could talk about eilenberg maclean spaces, right? Uh, so, uh, well, I have Posnikov towers, but I don't have fibers so very much. Uh, I mean, I have, I have fibers, of course, but it, it, they're, they're strange, right? I mean, I don't know how to take, what do I mean by taking the, the, you know, I have the sort of, I have layer N and layer N minus one, but what does it mean to take the fiber of that? I could take it at a chosen base point, but that's not going to be good enough for the purposes of, of, of writing down something like a, uh, a homotopy type invariant, like a pi n or something. Uh, so I don't know how to address that. Um, uh, might it be interesting to see how the Atal topology is stratified over the Nizhnevich topology? Oh yes, yes it is very interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe I'll just as a just as a little preview, just because I, I love this example. Um, let me give you just a quick example just to just to show you something kind of fun about this. So let's take, um, this is my favorite example. So I'm going to take the nodal cubic uh, and I'm going to take the local ring, the usual local ring uh, at the node. And I'm going to think about uh, the Galois category of that thing. And the Galois category, you know, it depends on what field I'm working over. Uh, but, you know, I, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to write down. You can understand it. But let me go further and actually think about something that you might call the Nizhnevich uh, Galois category. So the, the Galois category has to do with the Atal topology. I'm really taking the points for the Atal site. But I could try and take the points for the Nizhnevich site instead and work with that. And uh, it's very nice to see that what you end up with is, well, you end up with the node point, and you end up with the other point, and you end up with two maps that go just like that. Because you have two specializations. If I take the Hensel local ring at that point, I have two specializations from the node to the generic point of this. And so what does that mean? That means that I've got two of these maps here, two specializations at the, at the Disneyovich level. So this is gal Niz, as I like to call it. And well, if you take that space and you geometrically realize it, what do you get? You get exactly the circle. You don't get the profinitely completed circle, you actually get the circle. Uh, and so this is a situation that we, that, that I find very appealing because, well, this is just a, a finite category. It's finite in all the conceivable senses, right? It's a very finite category. Uh, but it produces 
uh, an honest S1. It doesn't produce the profiling the completed S1. And so that's why you're getting the sort of actual sort of fundamental group, not this kind of uh, profinitely completed fundamental group out of this kind of example. And uh, yeah, there's a whole lot to say. I mean, the difference between uh, gal Niz and uh, just the Zariski topological space of X uh, is entirely about the question of whether X is geometrically unifringe. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of fun questions in here that, uh, that you could ask yourself. Um, yeah, I think there's a whole interesting world here that I haven't thought about very much yet, but it seems promising. Uh, is there any kind of story for the FPPF topology or Lise et al? So for, uh, for Lise et al, yes. Uh, uh, so, so if you're thinking about stacks, um, then, uh, then there's a story for stacks. There's a, there's a Galois category attached to any stack. Um, and that's really just, there's nothing kind of deep about that. I mean, you're just going to take the stack and present it as a simplicial scheme and then take the Galois categories of those and, and, uh, and, and take the cold limit. <laughs> so it's a little dull in that regard. Uh, for FPPF, I don't know. I mean, I, I think if you take the, I don't know whether to expect something new for the FPPF topology. Uh, I don't really understand. I mean, so... Part of this story is really about uh, about the the atal topos, and uh, one of the advantages that we have is that we know very well what the points of the atal topos are, and uh, the points of the FPPF topos are a lot harder to understand. So there's a paper by uh, I'll probably mispronounce this name, but it's I guess it's Schoeir, um, Stefan Schoeir, uh, about the points in the FPPF topology. Um, and they're 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 funny, <laughs> so I don't really have anything interesting to say about that yet. But that's a good question. Uh, I do think that thinking about other topologies uh, might be promising. Uh, the Atal topology is quite special because it has the Atal topos is what we call a spectral uh, 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 topos, and that's the analog of uh, this condition right here, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to. to oh, my pen has stopped working. Okay, just in time. Uh, uh, this condition right here uh, in the topos theoretic world is what we call a spectral topos, and that's quite special. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know, I don't think the FPPF topos will be. Uh, is there a theorem that shows that the Atal topos is the finest one that is spectral? Now you're asking hard questions. Uh, I don't see why. No, I, I wouldn't, I, I can't, I, yeah, I guess you mean like the finest, like subcanonical topology that's spectral or something. I don't see why that should be. Uh, I think it might, there could be other things that are special, that are uh, spectral. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, for gal niz, is that a tall fibered over niz or niz fibered over czar? Uh, it's both. So, uh, if I understand your question correctly, um, so get the, what you have is you have this this sequence of maps. So you have X czar, which just for the minute, let's just pretend like it's a poset. Uh, so you have X czar, which kind of looks like that in this case, right? Because I took a local ring um, of a curve, uh, and then you have gal niz, and then you have gal X, which sort of has all the same stuff that gal niz has, but it also has, you know automorphisms corresponding to the absolute Galois group of the, of the fraction field. Um, do I get the SGA fundamental group from gal niz? Uh, I get the SGA fundamental group from gal x, but not necessarily from gal niz. Um, gal niz uh, is too, too coarse to know anything about, say, uh, uh, complicated field extensions or arithmetic. I'd have to pass all the way up to gal. But then absolutely, yes, I get the SGA fundamental, SGA three fundamental group. That's right. The non-profinite one, yes. Um, so that's actually a theorem of, of Peter again, that if you take the, and I'll, I'll talk about this next time as well, uh, that if you take the Galois category, which is a profinite category, and you take its nerve in the protruncated space sense, 
then you actually recover the protruncated homotopy type. And that's, that's one of the, the many excellent theorems that Peter proved uh, in exogamy. Um, Doesn't seem to be more questions. Maybe we should just all thank Clark again for a wonderful talk. And uh, thank the, you very next, much. the next talk is at uh, 6 p.m.